in a row, I'm Bill Wilichka saying... The single strand of spaghetti at three and a half inches for a new Guinness record. In Hamilton, Ontario, Tom Seidel fired up his rocket-powered fire truck for a 407-mile-an-hour Guinness speed record. We took you to Indianapolis, Indiana to meet all seven feet, seven and a quarter inches of Sandy Allen, the world's tallest woman. And Kim Goodman of Chicago, Illinois, successfully defended her eye-popping record by protruding her eyeballs in amazing 11 millimeters. And you witnessed the miraculous story of Ahad Israfil of Dayton, Ohio. Ahad and the surgeons who saved his life go into the book for the most extensive skull reconstruction. They believe it. So the, of saints, and they're not often seen. Now, what's interesting about this collection is that many of these pieces have never been displayed outside the Vatican. And even then, you would have been hard-pressed to find them. They were hidden away inside private apartments and chapels. Some of them you wouldn't even see if you were in the Vatican because they're in places that are closed to the public. And once this display ends in June, these angels will once again become invisible to Canadians anyway. And that's Canada Tonight. I'm Tony. ...of that terrible tragedy in Denver. It was just after lunch period at a high school in a suburb of Denver, Colorado. Another school shooting in the United States. This one, the worst yet. It appears 25 people are dead, including two students suspected to have been the gunman. Witnesses say at least two young men, perhaps three, walked in the school armed with guns and explosives and opened fire. Police and emergency crews surrounded the school for several hours while the gunmen were still inside. Witnesses who managed to escape described the scene. We heard, like, popping, and we didn't know what it was, and then I looked out the window, and there was this guy throwing, like, a pipe bomb at all the cars. <laughs> and then he came in, the, they, like, started blowing up and shooting everyone in the cafeteria. And then you could hear them laughing and running upstairs, and they were shooting anyone of color wearing a white hat or playing a sport. <laughs> and they didn't care who it was, and it was all at close range. And we could hear them shooting the place up. They went into the kitchen, which was right next to the bathroom where we are, were. And we could hear them moving things around and talking and just blowing the heck out of the place and prayed that they wouldn't find us and start kicking indoors because there for a while it sounded like they were kicking indoors. So we all went to the office. And was your teacher there? And did you um, lock the doors? We barricaded the doors with the desk and the file cabinet. And then how were you able to get out and know it was okay to run out? Um, well, we had the phones in there, so when all the boys took charge, and they got a hold of all the police. And throughout the whole time we were there, they um, told us when they were going to be coming, and kids had pagers in there, so they got a hold of us through the pagers, and then we called them back. The wounded have been rushed to hospitals in the area. Some of them have gunshot wounds to the head and chest. Hospital officials say all are in serious condition. Gunshots to the chest, another with single gunshot to the chest, boy with gunshot to the back, and the fourth boy with gunshots at least five to his chest. Witnesses have identified the gunman as students, part of a group called the Trench Coat Mafia. They were found dead in the school library. Police also arrested three young men outside the school. They've been described as friends and perhaps accomplices of the gunman. Aaron Schachter is one of the many reporters who have. development and testing of the Saturn 1B launch vehicle. And it was not by chance that Apollo 7 was placed almost exactly on its planned trajectory into orbit about the Earth. Very early in the flight, 
The general pattern of go for Apollo 7 was established in a conversation between the spacecraft and mission control at the manned spacecraft center in Houston, Texas. Right on the old button. Flight booster. Yeah. We appear we may be slightly more to low loss. Okay. Stand by. Take your call. Beautiful. Black photo or go. Apollo 7 was also go for an exhaustive series of tests of its worthiness in space. One of the first things which had to be learned was whether the astronauts could control the spacecraft combined with the S-4B Saturn stage. A very similar thing would have to be done during the early phases of a lunar mission. The Chris's smell. I am shocked, I'm astounded that anyone would go to the length that they do to call him at home and to say ugly things to him. It hurts a lot to see my son being... Uh, criticized and abused for, for something he can't control. It turns out Chris suffers from a very rare and very unusual genetic disorder called triethylaminuria, TMA for short. The liver doesn't process certain foods properly. The results can range from bad breath to body odor that in some people can be absolutely devastating. I always had a lot of effect on my family. <sighs> Cassandra Jackson in Philadelphia also suffers from TMA. For Cassandra, it started later in life, and she says it's cost her her friends, it's cost her her job. Just to go to an amusement park, just to stand in a crowd, parades, whatever, I don't have that anymore. All that is gone. So after exhausting dermatologists and gynecologists, Cassandra went to the Monell Chemical Senses Center to see Dr. George Preddy, who for the first time offered some help. Well, there is treatment, temporary treatments, but there is no cure for this uh, problem. Go ahead. Dr. Preddy says the first step is to have the condition properly diagnosed. Then antibiotics to kill body bacteria can be of some help. But most important, he says, is for the patients to avoid foods that contain substances not properly processed by their bodies. Such as eggs is probably the leading candidate. And no foods even made with eggs and no peanut butter, no whole wheat, no chocolate. Do you want to have some chicken with rice soup? A restrictive what? diet helps somewhat. When we visited Chris, there was no noticeable problem. But the diet isn't easy, and it's not a total cure. Pretty much any food that I eat is going to give off some odor. So I'd have to stop eating completely before uh, it would completely go away. So Chris puts up a brave front and tries not to complain. He hopes someday there'll be more research and perhaps a cure. In the meantime, though, he would ask for tolerance and understanding from those around him. People can think what they want to think, and I can't change that. But what I can change is letting people know that I smell like fish for a certain reason. Thirteen dead students and one teacher remain inside the school, along with the two gunmen, as police first had to go cautiously as they found more than 30 explosive devices in the school and in the homes of the suspects. The shooters are identified as 18-year-old Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Fellow students described them as outcasts, belonging to a group that called itself the Trenchcoat Mafia. Eyewitnesses say they were targeting blacks, Hispanics, and athletes. Overnight, police searched the home of alleged shooters, confiscating computer equipment, books, and they say ingredients to make explosive devices. Columbine High School and virtually all of the surrounding schools are closed today as the community mourns. The NHL has postponed tonight's start of the first round playoff series between the Colorado Avalanche and San Jose Sharks. And the Colorado Rockies called off their baseball game against the Expos for the second straight day. The Rockies said its players and coaches will wear a Columbine High School patch on their right sleeve for the rest of the season. The trench coat mafia, gothic culture, what is it? And could a tragedy like Littleton happen here? Kate Wheeler now with that story. Goth used to be a subclassification of punk, from Susie and the Banshees to Marilyn Manson isn't a huge leap. 
but surprisingly most goths don't consider Manson to be one of them, saying he's more of a shock rocker. The black-wearing, angst-ridden devotees lean more toward the cure and Sisters of Mercy. It's a style that was borrowed by the killers yesterday and distorted. Evoking Hitler and making pipe bombs isn't part of goth culture, which has been around for 20 years. In fact, the oldest goth club in North America is in Toronto, the sanctuary on Queen West. The Littleton killers evoked Keanu Reeves in Matrix and attacked in long black trench coats heavily armed. Movies like The Crow and Basketball Diaries were apparently also favorites. But experts here say that fashion choice isn't restricted to the dark side, noting black trench coats were worn by all the angels in John Travolta's City of Angels. Detective Colin McDonald with Toronto Street Crime Unit insists parents shouldn't panic if their teens are rebelling in a gothic way. Toronto's goths, he insists, are not a time bomb waiting to explode. Kids are always, as adolescents, are going to try the bounds and try different uh, ways to rebel, and it's uh, one of the ways that they do it. And there's really no major concern, as far as I've ever come across so far, with any of the gothic uh, young people. The trench coat mafia had a website. It disappeared off the net just hours after the massacre. But still, goth culture is easy to find on the web. There are thousands of sites, from fashion to cooking, as well as art, poems, and literature, admittedly glorifying death and despair. But on the same site that lists Susie and the Banshees as musical inspirations is also Tchaikovsky. Could it happen here? Well, of course, it has. Not the massive loss of life we've seen in America, but lest we forget, in 1994, two staff members were shot and wounded at a Brockton High School. In 1990, a teenager shot and wounded three students at a Burlington High School. And in 1975, a teacher and two students were shot and killed by fellow student Michael Slobodian at a Brampton High School. I'm Kate Wheeler reporting live. Now back to the desk. In other news, the TTC says put back away... to the top. I've turned these cans into can-do. Well, you smell terrible. Good luck to you, sir. Wow, he went from stinking rich to just plain stinking. <laughs> 13 women died, and closer to this city in Brampton in 1975, when a young man snuck two guns to school in a guitar case, then opened fire. Yesterday's shooting brought back the memories of that event to many who witnessed it and renewed their drive to make a difference because of it. Mike Wise reports. At Centennial High School, it's known simply as the incident. May 28, 1975, the day Michael Slobodian, a 16-year-old student, wandered the hallways with two automatic weapons. He shot 12 people, killing his English teacher and another student before turning the weapon on himself. And I was running by then, and I heard another shot, and I turned around, and the guy there was one guy shot in the elbow, and he was running behind me, dripping blood. 25 years later, and the shooting is still an emotional topic here at Centennial. No one on staff wanted to go on camera to talk about it. There's still a few teachers working here who were around when the shooting occurred. But for one former student, the memories of that day still linger. The young man who did the shooting um, killed himself in front of my brother's locker and for one, at one point I wasn't sure whether that was my brother on the floor or whether it was somebody else. Malcolm Hamilton is a teacher at Notre Dame Secondary School in Brampton. He was on hall monitor duty when the shooting started. We were walking down the business wing. We actually saw the barrel of a gun coming around a corner and we jumped into the business office, heard more bangs, stuck our head out, heard more bangs. Um, it's really a blur that day. Two gunmen wearing black trench coats. And Hamilton found himself drawn to coverage from yesterday's shooting, unable to watch some parts, uneasy with the sight of students in shock. He discussed the event and the non-stop coverage of it with his students this morning. I think if you make it such a large media event, it becomes a more attractive venue for people who are disaffected, who are alienated, who are looking to make a statement on the way out. And I think we should look for ways. Yes, it's a sad thing find out why it happened, work with that, look at solutions. For Hamilton, that involves having school counselors, psychologists, and even other students looking out for their classmates at risk. It was probably one of the reasons why I decided to go into teaching was because that student, that student who brought the guns into the school was isolated. I think we can do things to bring people um, back into a, a sense of belonging. And I think that um, thinking back, um, 
I guess there are a lot of people who thought that they could, could have made a difference in the end to what happened 25 years ago. And I think that same kind of reflection will go on, uh, will go on in Denver. Mike Wise, CBC News, Brampton. Toronto students are also shaken by the Littleton massacre, wondering if such violence could touch them here in their own high schools. Even though there is more security than ever inside schools, some students still worry about what kind of price they'll pay for bumping into the wrong student in a hallway and wonder what kind of role they themselves play in creating safe schools. We sent Robin Smythe to reflect on the Littleton tragedy with some high school students at Central Commerce. What happened at that Colorado high school yesterday was so horrific. It will happen, but what, you know, the situation in, in Colorado. This moment, once again, to hammer home to all the children of America that violence is wrong. To that national anthem, to the rock and roll national anthem. After a sleepless night, the students of Columbine High came back to school today to mourn the loss of their friends, to remember those who died, and begin searching for answers as to why it happened. As any parent in this community, I feel grateful that I can still hold my son, because there's many parents out there this morning that don't have the opportunity to hold their children anymore. I'm in shock. I, I feel real sick to my stomach about this. It doesn't even seem real. All day, their bodies lay untouched inside the school as police work to defuse the many unexploded bombs still inside. The gunmen have been identified as two of the victim's classmates, 18-year-old Eric Harris and 16-year-old Dylan Klebold. Students who knew them say they were considered outcasts at the school because of the way they dressed in dark trench coats and the way they thought. They apparently harbored a deep hatred for many of their classmates, especially minorities and the athletic crowd, the jocks, who they specifically targeted during their rampage. When they first came in, they said, all the jocks, please stand up, and nobody stood up. And they said, all the jocks in here are dead. If you have a hat on, if you have a white t-shirt with any sports emblem on it, you're dead. By day's end, all the bombs had been defused. Police moved on to the grim task of identifying the dead. Some parents are still waiting to hear for sure that their children are among the victims. The sense of shock here simply cannot be described. Several students told us the gunmen had suggested they were planning some act of revenge and cited Adolf Hitler's birthday, April 20th, as the day to watch. But as is so often the case, no one took them seriously. No one thought it could happen here. Jed Gahain, CTV News, Littleton, Colorado. Authorities in Littleton, Colorado are releasing more and more information about yesterday's high school massacre. The district attorney for the area says the two gunmen had been involved with police in the past. Both had been convicted of breaking into a car. And the local sheriff revealed just how heavily armed the teenagers were. Yes, we had uh, one, believed, 9mm semi-automatic rifle. Uh, it was a more of an assault weapon type style rifle. What brand name? I can't give you that information because the crime scene techs are working on that right now. We had two shotguns, uh, sawed off uh, stocks on them, and it appeared under one of the suspects there was another handgun uh, with that suspect. Those weapons will be, are being recovered right now by our evidence collection team. For deeper understanding of this mass shooting... It's empty now, and so is the heart of his anguished father, Michael. I was praying... When I, I was standing outside looking up, you know, praying, and one of the children walked up to me and said, he think Isaiah was, you know, demised, he's, he's dead. The 18-year-old was killed in yesterday's rampage. Classmates reportedly said one of the gunmen shot Isaiah in the head. The cold-blooded killing ended the life of a kid anyone would want as a son. I'm going to remember my son like he was, you know. He was outgoing. I mean, I feel as though he was taken too early. And like any high school senior, Isaiah had big dreams. His was to make it in the music business. Oh, it was uh, something that was lost, you know. I know he would have been one of the greatest. Isaiah loved music, and he loved the outdoors, too. His father says his son would spend hours out here landscaping the family's front yard. He loved working in, outside. 
He loved working outside, you know. Loved ones say it's impossible to make sense of such a horrible crime. Family friend Harold Berry. It's hard to put the words to it, just to describe the, the young kid. I mean, he just, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't do nothing to hurt nobody. But there's another reason Michael Schultz is outraged. Officials confirm black students were targeted by the shooters, and he believes his son was murdered because of the color of his skin. These hate crimes, man, these things have to stop. But for this family and so many others in Littleton, the pain of this tragedy will be felt in the sad stillness that lies ahead. That's what I'm gonna miss, you know. It's gonna be hard when I wake up, you know, and not hear the lawnmower, you know what I'm saying? The Shoals' two other children, Anthony and Michelle, also attend Columbine High School. They are safe, but like the rest of us, they are still trying. Who's known mostly because of their clothes, become infamous because of this tragedy. Stacy Sweet reports. They all wear black clothes, trench coats. Everybody kind of calls them trench coat mafia. The only thing I knew is that they were kind of an outcast group. The trench coat mafia. Who are they? What were they all about? All questions begging to be answered in the wake of the nation's most violent high school shooting. And one Littleton teenager says he knows. He got a glimpse of something unsettling yet to come. They were trying to basically pass off an image of, uh, of from, what, from what I understood, was more of an image of, we're here, don't forget about us. And, and the way to do that is attract attention. And attracting attention in their eyes was looking angry, being angry towards other students, you know. Professor Brian Levin is an expert in hatred and extremism. This trench coat mafia appears to be an extreme offshoot of the goth fantasy movement, which is this rebellious, youthful subculture. The face painting and the nails, sure. I mean, but that's just a look. There's no real definite line between hating someone because you do all this. Experts say groups like the trench coat mafia exist in schools all over America. These two trench coat mafia members, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, were smart kids. The gang had a passion for wearing makeup, painted nails, black dusters, and heavy boots, the so-called goth look. Harris and Klebold did not come from broken homes. Klebold even lived in this mansion and drove a black BMW. I've known Dylan myself about two and a half years. Uh, he really was a good guy. You gotta, you had to get on his uh, good side, I think. Uh, I know he didn't like jocks. Their violent behavior is similar to this incident in 1996 in Spokane, Washington, in which a student wearing a trench coat also opened fire at school. Experts link the obsession with killing and death to images seen in the movies, like this scene from Basketball Diaries. Some blame also has been placed on disturbing music these teens enjoyed. Their favorite group specialized in songs about violence and hatred, like Marilyn Manson and the German techno band KMFDM. Even in this yearbook photo, they proudly call themselves the Trenchcoat Mafia and use the cat.